Well, good afternoon and welcome to the closing keynote session. Just a reminder for those of you who haven't already done so, to please fill out the, the uh, evaluation form and pop it in the box outside there on the, the desk. I see there's quite a few forms in there already, but if you haven't done so and you'd like to make some comments, please do so. Very useful for us for the future planning. And it gives me great pleasure to introduce our closing keynote speaker for the conference, Cameron Duff. Many of you will be very familiar with Cameron's work through his extensive and innovative research publications and also through his role as Senior Editor for Social Science Research with the International Journal of Drug Policy. Cameron is a Vice-Chancellor's Senior Research Fellow at the Centre for People, Organisation and Work at RMIT University in Melbourne and also holds an adjunct research position at the National Drug Research Institute. His research explores the role of social intervention, uh, social innovation, sorry, in responding to complex health and social problems in urban settings. Cameron has explored these themes in qualitative studies of addiction, mental illness, housing insecurity, and social inclusion in Australia and Canada. His first book, Assemblages of Health, Deleuze's Empiricism and the Ethology of Life, was published in 2014 by Springer. Cameron's going to speak for about 45 minutes to allow some time for questions. And just a reminder that it'll be recorded but not the question time. And the title of Cameron's presentation is From Making Drug Realities from Analysis to Praxis After the Ontological Turn. Please welcome Cameron. Thank you. Thank you very much. Look, it, it's the first thing to do is to thank David and Suzanne and Pecker and others, everyone involved in the team, for the wonderful invitation to come here and speak today. I really appreciate that, David, in particular. Um, this is something I've been looking forward to very much. Thinking about what I wanted to do here today, I've got the great advantage of having three days of amazing content to reflect on, to try and, and think about what is it that we're all doing here together? What is the work that we share? The series of passions, the, the understandings, the particular kind of conceptual questions that we have, what is it that, that we can identify as being shared here in the work that we do? I'm struck by the fact that 10 years ago this group didn't exist. And it might be the case that, that, that not all of us agree with the idea that we are a group as such, that we have any particular set of identifications that we necessarily have a sense of the things that we agree on. But what I've been really struck by is that, that there is a sense here of a shared set of passions, I think. Now, that might not be a way of describing it that we can all agree on, but I'm um, struck by Carol's admonition on, on, on Wednesday morning that, that we think about, about problems in different ways. And I'm very grateful for that invitation to, to rethink some of the assumptions that I have about this work. And what has struck me over the last couple of days is that there are a series of distinctive matters of care that we all share. We don't share those, those concerns in the same kinds of ways. We don't all agree on the same kinds of priorities. But across the, the course of the work that I've been exposed to over the last three days, what I've seen is a distinctive set of articulations of care. And I'm going to speak a little bit, spend a little bit of time talking about that. Now, I know one from this kind of position shouldn't necessarily pick out individual works over the course of a conference. I haven't seen everything, of course. I haven't been to every session. I haven't seen every paper. But I wanted to, to do something that, that might be invidious, and I hope people will forgive me later for whose papers I missed. But there have been a series of papers over the last couple of days that have really struck me for the way in which they've mobilised a particular set of cares about the world, cares about people, cares about non-human entities, cares about the way we come together as a group to share these. Starting with Carol Backey's paper on, on, on Wednesday, Ken Tupper's paper on ayahuasca, Simone Dennis's paper for the grandest title of all time. You've got to use this, the uh, governmentality of the tongue. Please remember that. Please use it. <laughs> Nicole Vitaloni's paper asking us to think differently about, about the syringe. Faye Dennis's work, Alison Schlosser. That's the, the, the panel. These were four papers together on Thursday morning. That, that this is my personal favourite session of, the, of all the ones that I've attended. It was a really fantastic body of work. So thank you very much for sharing that, all of you. Alison Schlosser, I forgot to mention, sorry. Rebecca's, uh, Rebecca Tiger's fantastic work on, on neuroscience. Kane Race's great paper on care. Kate Sear's paper this afternoon, thinking about Aboriginal jurisprudence, and Steve Caster's work this afternoon. Now, I wanted to, to, I was thinking carefully about whether this is something that I should do, but I wanted to do this because these papers exemplify in my mind this insistence on caring. Now, I'm going to use this notion, this is, I'm kind of extemporising a little bit with this, but partly this is a response to Carol's sense that we should 
perhaps not be so quick to think about problems. Now, I was going to come here today and, and talk about my understanding of how this field has come together. This field has come together around a sense of a series of, of common problems. And I think that's true. I think prior to, to, your, to your talk on Wednesday, I would have felt comfortable saying that. I'd been thinking about this notion of care in the last couple of months, and now it feels, it feels better that, that what the field shares, to the extent that we share anything, we share a commitment to a caring practice. Now, I don't want to sound romanticised or misty-eyed about this, but my sense here is that what's distinctive about this body of work, perhaps even before there's a sense of a commitment to a set of intellectual interests, there's a real palpable sense of caring about things. Caring about them differently, bringing things to attention that haven't been cared about, thinking about how, in the work that we do, that we can open up spaces for care to be practised differently, for us to care differently about the world. Now, I, want, I wanted to open with that because this, I hope, will thread its way through all that I've got to say over the next 40 minutes or so. And I hope that over the course of this time, it'll become more clear what I mean by that and why I feel so strongly about this. What I wanted to do in leaving um, JD's quote here up on the, on the screen while I've been talking, though, is that, in a sense, this provides a more conventional way of thinking about what it is that we're doing here. Now, JD talks about this idea of, of, of what's distinctive about social research today, social research after the ontological turn. So he talks about the need for new assemblages of social research are required to fit together all the ways in which the world is now characterised by flows, connections and becomings, whose functioning logic is more about folds than structures, more complex than linear, more emergent than totalising. Now, I wanted to use this as, a, as an epigram, as it were, for the presentation, because it strikes me that this is a really useful way of thinking about you know, why are we bothering with some of this work? You know, why are we trying so hard working through very difficult comp uh, conceptual intellectual material? Why do we grapple with the kind of intellectual resources that we grapple with? Why do we then do perhaps the even more difficult thing of thinking about how can we begin to apply or operationalise these ideas in empirical work in novel ways? And it strikes me that why we do that is there is a sense that we need to, that the world requires this of us. Our encountering the world requires this kind of response. We need to be novel. We need to find new ways. Now, we need to find new ways because the world demands that we care about it. The world that we encounter in our work demands that we care about it. We don't do this work because we have a set of abstract intellectual concerns that we hope to satisfy through our work, although that's rewarding, of course. But I feel that what's, what's galvanising and unique about the work that we do is that the world that we encounter through our work demands that we care about it. So it's even more than this, this kind of, and this, this to me is the heart of the ontological turn, is that the world that we encounter does not just demand this kind of epistemological response, we need new methods, new ways of thinking about analysis, but the ontologies that we encounter, the things that we now pay attention, they demand our care. We have to care for them. How can we do that together? That's, in my mind, what, what characterises the work that we do together. That might seem idiosyncratic. I hope that over the next half an hour or so I can persuade you of its merits. So I have a very bad habit of, of just chunking text into PowerPoint slides. So just, just it's wallpaper, OK? But it, it, when, I, I, when I've got it in front of me, I feel like there's something there that reminds me. What did Cameron think when he was writing this two weeks ago? So what I've wanted to do is, as I've said, is to, is, it's, again, it struck me that this field didn't exist 10 years ago. It might be that we don't all feel comfortable identifying this as a particular kind of field. But the fact that we're all here together, this is the fourth itera iteration of this conference, I think there is a sense that we're here in a very scholarly way to share a set of concerns, caring practices, as I've said. So I was thinking about this and thinking, how did this happen? And it might be interesting to begin to trace a kind of genealogy of this field as a way of beginning to think about what it is that we've achieved together what are those kind of key pieces of work that have helped us to think, to think about how the, how the field might, might move forward? But then, perhaps more pressingly, at the end of the presentation, I'd like to think about what do the things that we've achieved enable us to do, and what can we do with the things that we've achieved? Now, again, I'm not, I'm not going to be stipulating what I think those achievements are necessarily or what the, the, that, that you need to agree with me. And I'm certainly not going to be suggesting that I'm kind of laying out a roadmap for future work that you all need to follow. That would be utterly presumptuous. I'm going to share some things with you that I think are interesting. So as I said, I think JD's, um, JD's quote there crystallises the challenge of the ontological turn, this sense that, that the world demands that we find new ways of interrogating, new ways of encountering it, new ways of caring for it. 
And I think what I've seen across the course of this conference and in my reading of, of literature in this field over the recent past is that I think that's why we're turning to this, this theoretical work. New materialisms, object-oriented ontology, assemblage theory, affect theory, new feminisms, the relational turn, etc., etc., etc. I think all of us in our particular ways are turning to this work for a sense of sustenance, I think. That, I mean, these are typically quite difficult works to engage with. And I think, again, most of us, it, it's not that there's a degree of intellectual curiosity that we find that this work satisfies. It's there's a sense that there's something deeply nourishing in this work that helps us to understand the worlds that we encounter and, as I've said, to care for it differently. So what is it that these turns enable us to do? And I think in some respects this is a renovation of the very nature of social science inquiry. I think in each of these, of these theoretical turns, there's a challenge to how we do social science, both conceptually and empirically. And I think that's, that's what this work shares, is that we're all in the process of working together to try and reinvent what social science might do, the methods in which we conduct it, but I think more critically for this group, the kinds of ethical, moral and political considerations that ought to inform that effort. You know, this is a very political field, I think, and this is in, in the papers that I, I mentioned before, what, what struck me most compellingly about this work was there was a very explicit politics about this. And now, again, I don't think that if I put all of those, those uh, presenters that I mentioned before, put them in a room together, I'm sure they wouldn't necessarily agree on very much, but I think what they possibly would agree on is that there's a, there's a very striking set of political concerns, a demand for a different kind of politics. So I've said here that Bruno Latour, I think, makes the most explicit and compelling case for why we're taking this so seriously. And that's that conventional methods are ill-equipped to account for the proliferating array of actors and actants in social life. It, in my view, has come to pass that, that established methods, now that's not to say that, that, that all established methods haven't proven to be useful. Interviews are incredibly central to work that I've seen over the last three days. So it's not to say that, that more traditional or conventional methods ought to, be, ought to be neglected. But there is a sense that it's not clear that, that, that methods that have typically been used in the social sciences are the right kinds of methods for the work that we want to do. I'm struck by Kane Race's paper yesterday where there was a sense that, that you know, this work demands us to think about method in different ways, that the kinds of theoretical investments that we bring to our work demand us to think about method in different ways. So Latour's response to this is famously, let agencies proliferate. And I think what I've seen over the, over the last couple of days again is, is some wonderfully compelling accounts of different kinds of agencies, things that come to matter in the world, in the worlds that we investigate, we encounter in our work. So I think in terms of, of a, a more narrow set of interests in, in alcohol and drug use more directly, the critical question here is how to account for these proliferating agencies without privileging the role of the human agent of consumption. I think again, if it's fair to say that there are things that we can all agree on, this seems to, in my view, to be one of them. That whenever we encounter drug and alcohol use, it's a mistake to begin with the human actor involved in that consumption. That if we do that, then a whole series of assumptions are, are drawn into the work along with us that cause us to neglect other kinds of forces, other kinds of entities. So again, if there's a sense that there's, there's something that we can agree on, I think this is one of them. So Latour's argument is that this, this commitment to avoiding the role of privileging the human agent requires us to, to investigate, to develop, to invent novel units of ontological units of analysis. And again, over the course of the last three days, I think we've seen a great number of these novel ontological units of analysis. Event, network, assemblage, chronotope, context, practice, and space. This has been central to my work over a long time, that, that how can we begin to interrogate the world that we encounter, the world that comes to us when we investigate it, the world that is exposed to us, the world that we make in our encounters with it? What kinds of concepts, ideas, feeling states, ethical sensibilities, ways of being, ways of encountering the world, what kinds of resources, feelings can we draw from this theoretical work that's going to help us to make sense of the things that we encounter, and more critically, that will help the things that, that encounter us make more sense of us too. What is it that we're doing in our interactions in the world? So all of these shift the research focus from the human subject of consumption. Now the critical thing here is that we don't denigrate the subject. We don't force it to the sidelines. And this is, I think, in Dave's talk yesterday, day before, sorry, the sort of flattening of ontologies is that the question is, what is the role of the human actor? If we, according to certain theoretical perspectives, wish to, wish to dispense with the human actor, then what is it replaced with? And what is, its, what 
whatever that thing is replaced with, normally a collection of entities, whatever that collection of entities is, what are its ontological relationships to the other things that we've identified as being of interest? So the advantage of, of standing in front of a microphone forcing you all to listen is that I can tell you what I think is the most useful one. And this is the event. So in my work recently, and I'm, I'm very grateful to my colleague Ella dilks frain for her work on this, and I wish that she were here today to share um, this with us, but I'm, I'm going to, to do that on, on her behalf, I suppose. So I think her work on the event provides the most useful way of thinking about a, a, a unit of analysis, a mode of inquiry that enables us to capture as much of the world as we possibly can, to the extent that we're capable of doing that. And this is, I think, what's really fascinating about the work that, that I've been exposed to over the last couple of days, is that some of you are becoming exceptionally good at this. And, and this has been wonderful to, to feel inspired over the, the last three days. You know, as individual scholars working within networks, what, through the process of sharing our matters of care with one another, can we become capable of, of being affected by? And I think, over, again, over the last three days, I've, I've seen, been exposed to work that makes me feel like there, there is so much to learn from one another in the ways that we're affected by the world that we encounter and, and the kinds of ways that we can become sensitive to the world through this work. So, as many of you know, I've, I was on a bit of a Deleuze kick for a long time. Slowly recovering, thank you. Events describe processes of change. They express happenings and becomings. So the critical question for, for Deleuze is what participates in events? What are events? So event, uh, for, for Deleuze, events have an ontological standing. They, they exist in the world. They are part of the way in which the world comes to, to a kind of welding, these terrible Deleuzean words that, that we use. But this, the, how does the world come to be a world? Events are one of the ways in which worlds emerge. So what participates in events? Now what's critical about the event is that if we think about events in terms of consumption, then what a Deleuzean would say is that why do we start with the human subject? If we think about the consumption of alcohol, we, we are almost inevitably drawn to the idea that there is a human agent of that event. That, just saw Kate just reaching for her water bottle, you know, that, that, that as you pick up the water bottle, you know, the common sense thing is that there is an agent with a desire expressed through a physical movement, consumption results, effects result, that's really all there is to it. Now, what we as a field have decided, being very presumptuous here, what we as a field have decided is that's wrong. That if we, if we are to approach the event of consumption and to privilege the human agent of that consumption, then inevitably we are led in instances where we think that consumption has caused harm to say, well, we started by assuming that the human agent was the most interesting, most important force in this event. In events where harm is produced, we're led by that logic to conclude that the human agent is also responsible for those harms that result through that event, event, uh, consumption event. And I think what I've seen over the last three days is that we all feel very troubled by that conclusion. Again, if there's anything that, 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 that unites us or that we can agree on, it's that idea that, that, that the work that we do leads us into these consumption events with this deep concern that we don't have particular human actors, in a sense, blamed for the harms that might be generated. That that is troubling to us somehow. And I think that's troubling to us because it limits, fundamentally, the kinds of caring practices that might be possible in response to those events. So I'm thinking again about Kate's wonderful paper this afternoon, that I don't know what we should, those of you who didn't see it will have to ask her later, but in, in questions of domestic violence in Aboriginal communities, if we are led through a course of logic to say that the individual agent who consumed that alcohol is the only agent of interest here to us, then we are never to be led to blame that same agent for the harms that result from that consumption. And what Kate's paper showed very beautifully was that that, that leads us to some really, really troubling consequences that seem to reinforce post-colonial race relations in Australia, a history of dispossession, patriarchy, a whole host of things that none of us would wish to endorse. So what does the event allow us to do is it allows us to approach that consumption in a way that doesn't start with the human agent. So what does Deleuze replace this human agent with? Forces, spaces, signs, bodies, affects, relations and discourses. I mean, I think that, that, that all of us would probably wish to add other things to that, but those are the ones that strike me as interesting and important. So it's encounters between these forces that cause things to happen. <clears throat> 
So if we approach the ontological turn, in my view, leads us to this kind of orientation to our work, that we approach consumption as an event in which many forces are active. Now, the, the analytical point here is that event analysis requires us in each instance to think very carefully about, to analyse very carefully, to open ourselves to being affected in new ways that might enable us to understand what kinds of forces are active here and what are their relative relationships. So I'm really hoping I'm going to have a beer after this, right? Really hoping I'm going to have a beer after this. Thank you, Monica. Now, in this instance, there is a force of desire that is running through me. Now, if I were to sit here and pontificate about what a Deleuzian would say about that, and maybe those of you who want to come for a drink later might wish to avoid me at this point um, when, I, when I start really getting on a, on a run on this. But, you know, we can, there's a kind of endlessly ramifying logic to the event. That, that, you know, the more we think about them, the more the event affects us, the more aware we are of a greater array of, of forces acting within the event. Now, the critique of Deleuze on this point is that that leaves us with this, this notion of just ever ramifying complexity, where there's a sense of infinite regress, you know, that, that, there's, that, that once we start following these threads, that they'll lead us to the universe. So event analysis, and Ella, um, her work does a, a, a wonderful job of this, is that the point is to, to always remember and this is where care is a kind of ethical orientation, what do we care about in this particular event analysis? When we think about encountering a, a consumption event, what do we care about in it? What do we want to change? Steve presented a paper um, just an hour ago or so looking at, um, at a whole host of, of really troubling legal processes in, in Denver, Colorado that have, have basically made homelessness illegal. And the kinds of social suffering that that has caused. I mean, it was a terrifying paper to experience, I have to say. Other people said it was sad. It, it's, it, it, it struck me as, you know, in that event, those events of homelessness, what in our encounters with it, what calls to us, what draws us into them, what do we care about? This is what the ontological turn means to me. So, for Deleuze, the problem is how to account for these forces. What ones do we care about? What ones do we think are worth paying attention to? What forces impose themselves on us? What forces affect us? How can we affect them back? So what forces participate in the event of alcohol consumption? It differs from event to event, of course. So the thing here that I'd like to add is that, that Latour focuses on agencies, and Deleuze focuses on force. Forces, as a result of his reading of Nietzsche, I would say. And I've, all, I've come to prefer forces to agencies because I think the forces, the, the notion of force enables us to think about, uh, about relationships that don't have a degree of intentionality to them. I know that we can think about agency in ways that don't involve intentionality either, but force, the notion of force is much further away from desire and intentionality than agencies. But that's, a, that's in a sense a, perfect, a personal, almost ethical choice. So, I could say here the ontological turn has resulted in a proliferation of agencies. I believe it's resulted in a proliferation of forces. So what, what have we done with this work? And I think the thing that we've achieved is a denaturalization of consumption. Now what I mean by that is that what I said before is that, that a common sense, kind of orthodox way of thinking about consumption is that we always start with an intentional human agent exercising through a degree of free will, a choice. They exercise that choice, they reach for a substance, the substance affects them, something happens, and there are consequences. So that's how we think about, now that, that again, through, through Kate's work and many others, this is codified in law, codified in policy, codified in our common sense ways of understanding the world. So the point I want to make here is that we have achieved something remarkable by denaturalizing that. Now, if I walk down the street later on and ask how many people are signing up to this crazy idea, that's going to be zero, right? But what we've achieved in this room is an intellectual rationale for this denaturalization. That we have achieved this idea, I think, that it's fair and legitimate to approach consumption in a different way that doesn't reify the human subject of that consumption. That argues that we shouldn't start with that subject. There are other forces at work. Now, what that has led us to achieve is a way of, of giving other forces that are at work in those events their due. Structural violence, power, gender, 
race, class, all of these important things. But what's really critically important in my view is that we've let these forces enter into the consumption event in a way that forces us to understand in each individual incidence, in each event, how are they actually working. This is the Deleuze enemy. This is why I spent so much time with Deleuze's work. Deleuze says real experience is the thing that you must start with. Don't start with an abstract structure. Don't start with class as an abstract structure. Start with classing, the event of classing, the event of gendering. How is it happening right now in this room? How is it happening in real experience? Deleuze forces us to lead right into the event, to get as close to it as possible. And so in each consumption event that I've heard talk about over the last three days, this is what I think we're talking about. We're asking ourselves to return to the, each individual event that we've we're interested in, what kinds of forces are running through them. And what we've achieved through that focus is the intellectual salience of the argument that the human subject is not necessarily the most important thing that we're talking about here. It might be, there might be particular events in which a kind of emergent, durable subject might be important. But there are other instances where we might say that there are other forces that are far more important. In Steve's work this afternoon, the law is clearly far more important that are particularly these kind of legal hybrids that he talked about, that Steve talked about. In, in some instances, these might be the most, in a sense, forceful agencies working their way through these events. So how has this achievement come about? I wanted to start, I'm, I'm, what I'm trying to do is to, is to trace a kind of intellectual line that leads us to this point. So I wanted to start um, talking about the ontological turn at perhaps a very odd place and that's with drunken comportment. Now, I was led to this, conversations over the years with David Moore and Robin Room in particular, others have been important too, but the sense that this work is important because it's the first instance in a, in, in, in a particular kind of set of intellectual debates where the argument that intoxication is culturally mediated becomes intelligible. Now, of course, I spoke to Robin about this yesterday, and of course he reminded me that, that this has a long history. There's always more to the story than when one knows. And that in different times and places in our history, this argument has been, has been made in different kinds of forms. But I think in terms of, of, of a, you know, our understanding, I think this is a seminal piece of work because it makes the argument that intoxication is culturally mediated. Now, what this does is it begins to break open the event of consumption by letting culture in. And it does this by pointing historically, culturally, socially, to instances where consumption events don't produce the same kinds of things. And so it forces us to accept that, well, how is that possible? Why is it that, that intoxication in one cultural setting produces particular kinds of consequences, violence, perhaps aggression, um, whatever it might be, and in other instances produces something very different? So drunken comportment begins to add forces to consumption events. So the key point here is that pharmacology does not wholly explain alcohol's effects. So what can this mean? Again, this is the common sense view is that, that I drink, I have two drinks, I feel good. I have five drinks, I feel like I've forgotten why I had the second drink. I have 10 drinks and I forgot where my hotel is, you know? So this kind of idea that, that, that alcohol's effects can be explained pharmacologically. This work begins to say, no, that's not the whole story. So the ontological turn. This, I'm going to do something that is, is equally invidious. I'm going to share with you the work that over the last 10 years or so has done the most to help me understand what the ontological turn might be. Now, these are works that have affected me, that have made my brain work differently. And again, later on, you can work out for yourselves whether that's been a good, a good effect or not. But, but this, is, this is work that has... has in a sense, created the hinterland that we sometimes talk about. You know, the hinterland is a sort of set of conditions of possibility. This is the work that has pushed into that hinterland and has opened up new space. John Fitzgerald, an assemblage of drugs, desire, and techno. He maps an assemblage in a Deleuzean sense, and this was, this was a space that I felt, being a child of the 90s, this was a space that I felt like I knew very well, and John mapped that, that territory and articulated the ways in which forces encountered one another in a way that made me realise that how we understand the relationships between bodies, affects, spaces, passions, capacities, 
this is a more interesting way of, of thinking through what's happening in an event of consumption. Not the idea that, that some individual young people decide to take drug X, another group of individual young people take drug X plus drug Y sometimes, that no, there are bodies, affects, spaces, passions and capacities, and it's the way in which these forces come together that's interesting. I realise I'm going to have to work my way through this more quickly because I think by six o'clock you guys are going to be sick of listening to me. Um, Nicole Vitaloni's the, syring the syringes prosthetic. Here we have a material object that's acting. And again, this is a profoundly important piece of writing because it makes the case for the syringe as an actor, as an agent that has capacities, that is acting, that is making a difference. And in some of her work, it's clearly the case that the syringe is far more important than the human agent in describing an outcome. Peter Malin's body space assemblages a body folded into space, where space acts in consumption events by transforming bodies. I think Steve's work this afternoon in a very powerful way, the idea that, that bodies are denied the capacity for rest. Space is clearly acting in an event. David Moore, Suzanne Fraser, the subject of harm reduction, one of my all-time favourites, that this notion that, that subjectivities are active in events, that they are transformed in events, that subjects aren't stable and fixed, of course, they are transformed in events, enacted in practice. Helen Keane, Addiction and the Bioethics of Difference, Feminist Reading of Difference and Ethics, The Unfolding of Signs of Difference. I'm sorry, I'm going to have to run through this a bit more quickly, so, so, um, so get out Google Scholar. If you don't know this work already, this, this, is, this is kind of must-read stuff. It's like your, your favourite records, right? This stuff is, this, is, this is the stuff that I turn to for, for sustenance that, that makes me feel better about the world. Spaces of Consumption. David Moore and Paul Dietz work on enabling environments, that, that spaces that we shouldn't always think about space in terms of risk, that there are enabling forces at work within spaces as well. Kane's work, I could have picked lots of things, Kane, but this is one that, that I've picked. It fit with my chronology, right? Pleasure and drugs, passions, affects, capacities that circulate in active spaces of consumption. Again, work that helps us to understand how affects work as kind of fragments of subjectivity, as capacities that, that circulate and attach to bodies changing what they can do. Jakob Demant's work when alcohol acts, alcohol as an agent within, within particular consumption events. What does it do? How does it act in space? How does it transform things that, that, that bodies do when they encounter one another? Darren Weinberg, fragments of post-human subjectivity. Again, this idea that, that what happens in events of consumption is the circulation of fragments of subjectivity, particular perspectives and orientations that drugs open up to us, sometimes terrifying, sometimes enlightening, sometimes neither. Frederick Bowling's work on alcohol assemblages, effective atmospheres of consumption and pleasure. Ella Dilks Frayne's work on the event of consumption I've talked about a little bit. Kate and Suzanne's work on jurisprudence and the role of legal practice. Faye Dennis's work on encountering triggers. I mean, I'm sorry that I've had to, I allowed my preface to roll on the way I always do. I'm sorry I haven't been able to talk about this work in quite the depth that I wanted to, but I realize again that, that, that the day is, is growing long. So what, what this work does for me is that it helps to make sense of these forces that are at work in consumption events. So this literature has inspired a proliferation of forces. Each of these pieces of work draws attention to a different kind of force and helps us to understand how it's acting in a consumption event. So who or what is present in each event of consumption? Who or what acts in these events? What makes a difference? What expresses an effect? This leads to the notion of emergent subjects and emergent causes. So the, the, the point of this work is that I've tried to, to, I suppose, convey what I understand the ontological term to mean, but why it's been so important. And it's been so important because what it's done in this Deleuzean vein is bring us closer to real experience. In each consumption event, these forces are at work. These forces make a difference. Now, they're not always present in the same kinds of ways, of course. There's an analytical calculus at work here that demands that we kind of think about, are each of these forces present? And if they are, how do we know? That's the epistemological question. How do we know what they look like? That's the ontological question. And how do we know what difference they make? That's the analytical, ethical, and aesthetic question. I should write that down. That just came to me just then. OK. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Lucky for Cameron. OK. So the thing I wanted to do in the last 10 minutes or so is, is begin to imagine where might this be leading? Because my feeling is that, that as I've tried to say, is this is an incredible achievement. 
that what we've done as a field, I think, is establish the intelligibility of the claim that other forces matter and that we should care about these other forces. So I wanted to spend the last 10 minutes or so thinking aloud, as it were, about where this turn might be leading. Now again, I'm, I'm, I'm giving you my sense of where this might be leading. You will have your own, and my sense is not necessarily more accurate than yours. It's important that I, I, I set that right from the outset. But what are the key galvanizing questions? I'm sorry I didn't change my slides. Problems, because you're right, problems is the wrong word. It's, it's not care is a better word in my view, but problems is that there's a, we use that too loosely. You're, you're absolutely right about that, Carol, thank you. So there are other ways of, you know, let's, let's be more rigorous about that. So as I've said, the key achievement has been to establish the utility of denaturalizing consumption. And all I mean by that is the idea of, it's not just the human agent that's important here. That's what I mean by denaturalizing consumption. So consumption is not a simple problem of a subject and a substance. Those things are present, but they are made in the event as we've been learning about the last three days they don't necessarily exist prior to the event, or that the, the ways in which they exist prior to the event are not as interesting as what happens to them in the event of consumption. So I think the key point here analytically is that, that this simple logic, that consumption is a simple problem of subjects and substances, it doesn't explain enough of what we encounter. And I think this is, in a sense, why we've all been driven to this work, why we're all drawn to it, is that it doesn't explain enough. The things that we encounter in our work, theoretically, ethically, morally, empirically, that, that this older way of thinking doesn't explain enough of what we encounter. But more critically, it doesn't enable us to do very much, I don't think. So widening our analytic scope to include a range of human and non-human forces has produced richer empirical accounts. I think this is a better empiricism. Can you talked yesterday about a radical empiricism. It's a, it is. I think it's a better empiricism. There's more of the world in this account, more of the world that's available to us to care about more of the world in our accounts that wants to care about us. So we can now explain more of the complexity of alcohol and other drug use, I think. So where is this leading? I think this, what we've done is we've established a legitimate ontological ground for approaching events differently. And I think that's, that's, that's a significant achievement that I think we can all feel great about. I think this is, this is an important thing that, and this I think is something that the field shares and that, that is what's different about this field from others. So how can we build on this ground? This is again what I wanted to spend the last couple of minutes talking about. How can we build on this ground should we want to? In part, it might be fair to say that, that we need to, in a sense, spend the next several years um, reinforcing the ontological foundations of this work. That, that there is much, much more work to be done to kind of flesh this account out. I think that's true. But I think, I think it's also a, a, a kind of space that we can move from. It's a space that, that, that we, can, we can lead out from. There's, there's more to be explored, I think. Now, I've said here, queer theory may provide a compelling guide, and I'm gonna, that might not seem like an obvious thing to, to work from. Well, I'm sure for a lot of people it is obvious, but I'm, well, I wanna talk about the Safer Schools Initiative in Victoria. Now, this might feel like a, a complete kind of schizophrenic left turn, but bear with me. <laughs> so I had a wonderful encounter with a colleague at the University of Melbourne at the end of last year, and he was sharing his PhD program. He was doing a, a genealogy of safer schools. And we had a long conversation afterwards, and he kind of laid out his account of how safer schools came to happen. Now, his starting point, now, safer schools is a, an anti, notionally an anti-bullying initiative, um, for LGBTIQ students in, in secondary school, which is the, I don't know what the, the Finnish equivalent might be, kids aged between 12 and 18 um, prior to tertiary education. So it includes a um, strong anti-bullying focus that is mainly concerned to promote safe environments that are supportive, inclusive of students and staff and families. Now, that's in a sense the, the, the kind of simple policy account of what's going on here, but but the, the, the genealogy that David laid out for me was that this is rooted in queer theory and a particular set of political ambitions about denaturalizing sex and gender, where schools were identified as a critical kind of structural strategic point where that system of sex and gender is made and remade. So it was very strategic and important. So it was challenging, the aim is to challenge the reification of sex and gender in schools, and, and if you if you read some of the foundational documents around safer schools, even some of the policy documents, they'll talk very explicitly about challenging heteronormativity, challenging this kind of naturalization of sex and gender. 
So it's about, in a sense, teaching kids that sex and gender is contingent and not natural. So the question that I had for David was that how did this become official government policy? Because that, that's, it's, it's kind of a remarkable thing to have achieved, right? This idea that, that schools, what we're teaching the next generation of young people, is that, that a la kind of queer theory 25, 30 years ago, that sex is made, it's not natural, and that, that, that sexuality is a kind of contingent phenomenon, it's not natural. Now, for those of us who are steeped in, in queer theory, I mean, that's a, that's a contestable claim, but it's in a sense the, the achievement that queer theory has made. So again, how did this happen? So again, I talk about safer school leaders often citing queer theory as a source of this work. So the thing that I put to David was that how is it my understanding is how is it that reactive conservative education bureaucracies have abandoned traditional views of, fa of gender in favour of queer theory? How, did, how, did, how do we queer education? Now, of course, I had a long conversation with Nicole Vitaloni last night who reminded me that let's not overstate the achievement, let's not overstate the extent to which the, the, um, that this, this has become official state policy that now Victoria is queering education. So I'm... I'm I, agree with that, that point, that let's not overstate the achievement. But it's still the case that we have a safe schools program that's by the end of 2018 will be mandatory across all Victorian secondary schools. That seems to me to be a very significant achievement. Now, what I want to do here is to make the argument that, that queer theory denaturalises sex and gender and over a long series of political struggles leads to a change, a fundamental change, in the way questions of sex and gender are approached in schools. The way my sons, in the next 10 years, as they move into, into high school, the way they will approach this, that will differ very, very radically from the way I encountered it. So that's in the space of one generation. That, that, that's interesting to me, how that, that came about. So, five minutes. Is that five minutes Cameron time or five minutes clock time? <laughs> okay, I'm gonna, I'll keep moving. So the, 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 the parallel that I want to make here is that just like critical drug studies, safer schools initiatives are grounded in a rejection of theoretical orthodoxies, common sense as it were, and the proposal of alternative positions. So the parallel I want to draw here is that what we've achieved with the ontological turn in drug studies is a denaturalisation of consumption, a denaturalisation of the will, a denaturalisation of intentionality. This idea that that's not the only thing that can be told, can be said about consumption events. Safer schools is premised on that queering of a denaturalising of sex and gender. So there are parallels there, I think, that we've, we've the, the kind of the account, the reified human subject that lies at the heart of each of these projects is transformed and replaced with something else. Now, what I think is interesting about Safer Schools is that across the course of the last three days, what I've encountered is, is story after story after story about encountering structure and power structural violence, encountering the kind of sharp end, the sharp point of politics, where we're talking about treatment systems, education in schools, well, you know, state welfare responses, the law, that, that we, 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 we're talking about kind of encountering structures that seem incredibly um, impervious to change. And I'm sure, this is the way David told me the story about safer schools, is that that's the way education appeared 25 years ago, that it could not be changed, or that it could only be changed with a very great struggle. It took and is taking a very great struggle. But my point here is that I think there is a parallel here for us as we think about the kinds of structures, the kind of power relations that we encounter in our work. We ought to be struggling with them because we need to care about them. We care about the world that we've encountered in our work, and that world wants us to care more about it too. And if we care about these worlds, then I think we want, to, we want to interact in these worlds differently. Now, I think there's a scholarly interaction that lies at the heart of our work that's critically important. But I wonder if in Safer Schools there's also a lesson here that, that maybe there's more that could be done. Now, the lesson from Safer Schools, I think, is that it's grounded. It's a kind of old-fashioned so, new social movement story that's grounded in political alliances, that's grounded in coalitions, that gra that's grounded in different different communities coming together, mobilising around a shared set of political concerns, and then working through the problem of what to do about them. And I'm struck a little bit, I have to say, by how I think something in our field has been lost around that. I was talking last night, if we think about harm reduction, mm -hmm. 10 years ago, I've seen a couple of, of papers today that, that, that seem to that have reminded me that we've lost a little bit of that. 
Partly that's been political as we've moved from a kind of harm reduction policy um, perspective to one that's grounded in recovery that, that feels a little more neoliberal and reactionary and conservative. But it feels to me like the drug sector that I came into 15 years ago, there was a lot more interaction between different parties in the sector, between scholars and academics and clinicians and activists and policy makers, bureaucrats and so forth. And that's what lies at the heart of safer schools, that these interactions between different stakeholders, as it were, coming together, mobilising around a shared set of political concerns, then infiltrating the public service and leading to policy change. Okay, I'm, I'm... So in a sense, just a generation ago, safer schools is unthinkable, but now it's law. It's wrong. Policy. So I think it's impossible to imagine schools teaching queer theory, but that's something like that is happening. So I think it's arguably the same for critical drug studies today. Imagine, for example, drug, drug education after the ontological turn. What does treatment look like after the ontological turn? What does the law look like after the ontological turn? So is there more that we could be doing to begin kind of opening up those spaces, to, leading, to letting the work that we do lead us into the care practices that the work seems to be demanding of us, that the things that we encounter in the world that demand us to care about them, can we care more? Can we care differently? Can we learn from each other how to care differently? How the world that we encounter, how it affects us, how we can respond to that in, in a more powerful way, if you like. So this seems to me to be the focus of the best of recent work. And again, it's, it's, this is work that has affected me. So I don't mean to say, if your name isn't on the screen here, that doesn't mean that you're not doing fantastic work. That, that it just means that, that I, I, I'm yet to be affected by it. <laughs> In the same kind of way. That sounded ridiculously pompous, didn't it? OK. So Fraser Moore, Sia, Keane, Phrygia, et al. This is, this is work that, that takes us into the law, policy, political processes, treatment services, the media, et cetera, in different kinds of ways, and asks us how to care about these systems differently. How can we, how can we begin to work in these systems in ways that might allow us to, to be affected differently by them, but how to, how to kind of change the forces at work within them? How can we do this? So I think very quickly, Safer Schools provides an interesting contrast. Though of course, I'm not suggesting it's a, it's a model to follow necessarily. But I think it might be the case that, 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 that 15 years ago, the work that was done in harm reduction, maybe that's an equally interesting model to follow. That, that, that some of that, in my view, some of that kind of political mobilization has been lost a little bit. That, the, the, as I said before, the work of activists, policymakers, um, that the kind of coalitions of interest that emerged around harm reduction, that they, I think there's something to remember in that history that can be very powerful for us today. So the challenge now is to grow, I think, for the field, and I'll, I'll finish on this. I think that, that you know, it's important that we recognise the achievement that's been made. It's important that we recognise the value of the work that we're doing together. Now, again, that's not to romanticise the work or to, to be too self-congratulatory about it. But I think these are significant achievements. And I think we ought to, to stop for a moment and to reflect on those achievements. And I think a conference like this is a great time to do this. And then to think about how can we continue to work together to build on these achievements? Where are the, the crucial practices of care that we want to move into? Where are the kind of interesting, striking challenges that we want to spend more time on? Where are the coalitions that we can mobilise that can enable us to take the work that we're doing and to push it into new spaces? Now, I don't have the answers to these things, of course. I think there are some parallels with safe schools. I think there are some parallels with, with harm reduction um, movements in, in the recent past that, that, that we ought to reflect on. I think partly the challenge with the ontological turn is that let's not forget our theoretical history, our empirical history, our political history. Part of, I think, a, a really strong critique of the ontological turn is that it does kind of encourage us to, 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 to the view that there's kind of nothing after Foucault that we need to worry about. Now, for somebody who did his PhD on Foucault, you know, that's, that's a real challenge, right? That, that, that to remember that, that there are other, there's, there's historical work, intellectual work, conceptual work that can be relevant for us. So let's, let's kind of continue to expand the field and to bring those voices in. So very quickly to close. So these are questions that, that I think I'd like to put to all of us, challenges, but also <laughs> things that we, we obviously care about to do with the law and public policy, with advocacy. You know, the new social media tools that enable us to reach audiences very quickly, how can we use those tools in different ways to, to mobilise different kinds of practices of care? Questions about addiction care, recovery and treatment. Where does the ontological turn lead us to? How can we reimagine addiction treatment? What would it look like? Questions about education, harm reduction, prevention. Questions about media and representation, about identity. 
you know, that, that all of this work, if we think about the ontological turn, where does it lead us to in, our, in questions about subjectivity, for example? Where might a focus on consumption events lead us? We've built something, I think. You know, there's, there's, there's now all in the room a kind of a sense of an intellectual energy, a wonderful space from which to, to work from. Where might it lead us? As I've said here, I think much to anticipate for the next CDP conference. Thank you.